Welcome to the first day of the Lightning Talks. Today we have about 10 speakers. I'm about. I'm still working on it. If you are a Lightning Talk speaker, you should by now be in the front row on this section. And they all know where they're going, except for the person who hasn't shown up. Julian, if you ever do show up, wander up front. If you're going to give a lightning talk advertisement, at some point while the talks are switching, wander up and sit in the front row on this side. You'll come up. There's only the one microphone, so we'll be switching it back and forth. Say what you got to say, and then go back to where you came from so someone else can have your seat in the front row. If you come up to give an advertisement and they're still clapping for the speaker over here, don't start. I won't count it against your time. If you're a speaker and you're all set up, ready to go, and they're making some noise for the advertiser, don't worry. I won't count it against you. Your time starts when you make a speaker move. That means when you start to talk or move a slide or something. So if you're really having technical difficulties, keep focusing on it because I might start eating into your time. Remember, at four minutes in, we get a ding, and at about five minutes in, we get a gong. So, you're up. Oh, while he's setting up. Do you want me to start? Just get up here and do your head. No, never mind. He's, he's, he's ready. He's ready. He's ready. He's ready. You're ready already. Well then, hi, I'm Patrick. And today I want to talk about relocatability. Um, and that's what I worked on the last half year, making Rakuto portable, relocatable. So the problem we had up to now, um, imagine you want to convince your boss that you can use Perl 6 at work. And you got him to the point where he's willing, willing to try it out. So he goes to his computer, switches it on, goes on the web, goes to perl6.org, pushes the big download button, and finds only an installer, but he's not willing to install something but he, because he just wants to try it out and doesn't want to put stuff in his registry, in the start menu or stuff, he just wants to try it out. But there's no other option, so it, ju so it just does the download, starts the installer reluctantly, only to find it's installing to C Rakudo. Why does it do that? He wants to install it into C program files and that's the point where it just stops and says, okay, I'm not gonna try this out, okay, the guy has to come back next year, maybe we can see if it works out then. And the reason um, this is currently the case is because Rakuto is not portable. You cannot put it into a location, install it into one location, then move it to another. And it's not able to have spaces in its path. So on Windows, program, files, has a space. Your desktop, it usually has a space, forename, space, last name, also all not possible. But that is going to change, and I want to show you that. So, so on C, there's this relocatable Rakuto folder. It has a small program in there. What it does is just using a module, generating some SVG, and putting um, the location of the script in there, and then it's displaying it. I can start that, and it should come up with, hi there, and I am, and that's the path where the script is located. So far, nothing special. Thing is, I can move this folder to the desktop, open it up, start it again. And it comes up, works as before, and has the new path in it. <laughs> and notice there's a space in there. <laughs> so what you just saw is um, basically three things that I'd like to put a point on, it's I moved it around and there's nothing anywhere else on the hard disk that it requires. I put this on a laptop of someone else that has not that has who has nothing to do with Pulse 6, it also worked. It works with spaces and paths, that's especially important on Windows. And 
when you install a module in there, it installs the module into that folder. So you can install loads of stuff, put your script in there, and with that, you have a nice way to deploy, quickly deploy something you can hand over to people. That's very little work to get something up you can hand around and it just works everywhere. Um, the plan is to provide free compiled archives for Windows, Linux and Mac OS um, with the next release. Um, at the moment we don't have any, but with the next release we want to provide those. And maybe, just maybe, we'll even be able to provide combined packages um, that will work on all three Windows, Linux and Mac OS um, by just bundling the virtual machine that's beneath Rakudo for all three operating systems um, and putting the same Rakudo on top. That should work, but we have to try that out yet. There are some caveats. Um, the biggest is it does not work on OpenBSD or IRX. That's because of a technical limitation. Um, those operating systems, they just have to live with non-portable Rakudo for now. But apart from that, I think we're good to go. Yeah. All right, so something I want to do when I started my talk this morning. Uh, how many people here are here for the first time at a European conference? Raise your hands. Wow, every time, I love this. So some people ask, um, how do you join the pro community? You just did. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Hello, everyone. Uh, is, is this, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah? okay, good, all right. Hope you're all having a good conference. I must say it's lovely to be back in Riga. Uh, right, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, we're, we're mostly software developers here, um, uh, computer programmers, and it's a kind of a new pro profession, right? Uh, since the uh, end of the Second World War, it's, it's sort of really taken off. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to think that uh, when my parents were born, there was no such thing as computer programming. It just didn't exist. So I wondered, where, where does uh, computer programming sort of fit in to, to the world, into professions? Is, is, it a branch of, um, is it a branch of mathematics, for example? Well, uh, not really. I mean, we sometimes we use a bit of mathematics when we program, but it's, it's not really a mathematical profession. So uh, what is it then? Some of us maybe have gone to university and studied computer science. So is programming science? Well, we don't really follow a scientific method, so you couldn't really say that programming is science. Right? <laughs> uh, so not mathematics, not science. Uh, engineering. I have a degree in software engineering. Uh, when I went to university, my school was in the same school as the aeronautical engineers and the civil engineers. Uh, so surely programming is engineering. Well, my wife is a civil engineer and, and the engineers laugh at us if we try and say that programming <laughs> is engineering. Yeah, we're just not rigorous enough, um, like if you, if you need to build a bridge or a dam. So no, uh, programming isn't really engineering either. So what is it? Well, uh, we talk about writing code. So perhaps uh, it's, we're more akin to authors. I mean, there's certainly a creative aspect to, to writing code, uh, like, like uh, writing a novel, for example. And I've heard rumors that some programming languages have been written by linguists, so we might be moving in that direction. I, I think that's probably go going a, a little way to, towards what the answer is. <coughs> but um, actually, I think that programming is more like art. Uh, I think it's like writing, uh, uh, like uh, painting a beautiful painting, a sculpture, or perhaps m most closely, perhaps like uh, composing music. Uh, when when an artist uh, wants to to create a, a, a piece of work, then every brushstroke, uh, ev every note has to justify its existence uh, to to be in 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 the art. And that's the same way I feel about my code. When I write my code, I want it to be beautiful, and I, every character that's in my code has to justify its existence. Or if there's nothing there, that also has to justify why there's nothing there. So, yeah, code is art, problem solved, okay? Uh, now, 
sometimes art needs to be restored, uh, and 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 that's that's just something which has to happen. Uh, music, maybe want, uh, someone wants to reimagine some music or reinterpret it or make a remix. Uh, or, or provide a cover version, and sometimes cover versions can be better than the original. And uh, I'll, I'll show a few here. And uh, I'm not taking any questions on this because this is just a, a matter of fact. Okay. <laughs> um, but also, but sometimes art restoration is more akin to vandalism. I think. Uh, <laughs> So sometimes the art restorer uh, wants, to, wants to make everything regular, <laughs> wants, uh, wants to make things, yeah, every, everything needs to fit into some uh, predefined ideas. And that takes the soul out of, out of the artist's work. It, it, it removes the essence of, of what the artist was trying to put into place. Um, and this is exactly the way I feel when someone wants to come along and run some automated tool over my code that I've sweat blood for uh, to, to make it beautiful, and someone comes along and wants to run Pearl Tidy over my code and run roughshod over it. <laughs> so I have one practical piece of advice for you to take away from this talk, and that's to go and type this line into your Bash RC. Thank you. Hi. Almost a year ago, I had a very pleasant experience when our professor said, I have this one very weird project. I'm in. <laughs> uh, shortly after, I looked at pictures like that. And uh, the doctor, nice doctor, explained to me um, these pictures are created by ultrasound probes uh, that are listening to your MCA, which is the middle cerebral artery, or in layman's terms, that the lifeline for your brain, yes? And um, there you have a nice diagram where you have a time axis, and y-axis, which is velocity, and the color coding uh, tells you how many particles at that time, at that velocity, were flowing through your artery. Yes. Um, so I said, Nothing could be easier. I have here some uh, region of e interest. Um, read out all the numbers, read out you know, the color scaling, and translate um, all the colors, make some third grade math uh, to sum up the numbers, uh, put it out as SVS. What can go wrong? Yeah, some default pipelining uh, for working that, taking some default modules to make that. And there's already the first problem, because I didn't listen to Nicholas. He warned me in Gummersbach, I, I sat in his talk, and I just ignored it. So, after three days of work, uh, I used <laughs> three standard modules. But uh, the problem started uh, because there were already some studies and a little bit of data. Um, and, um, of course, we had easy problems, because uh, the experiment has to be running when the pictures are taken. So we have here the intro screen, see the nice uh, 90s uh, computer graphics picture. Uh, the software is as old and written as similar. Yeah, but uh, you had sometimes so pop-up windows when the supervisor still uh, sets up the parameter. These pictures are really easy to sort out. Uh, but you have other issues, many issues. And I could give uh, two talks about uh, how I sorted that out, but you all were there, done that, found some ugly heuristics to sort out the weeds. Using uh, Perl for that was great. I want to talk about what I learned about. Uh, lesson one, I thought uh, the doctor doesn't care if his study uh, gets computed in one or two nights, Quality is more important than speed. That was my assumption. What I didn't know, quality 
is speed in that. Be and uh, that's really um, easy because uh, I, when testing my uh, heuristics, I had to rerun over and over. Like I said, about three and a half gigabyte. And to do that and to fine tune uh, the heuristics, it had to be fast. Uh, the other lesson I learned, um, because you get mostly taught solve your issues linearly. Yeah? I told I have this pipeline uh, for the stations. Actually, what I did, I rewrote many stations several times, use knowledge from there over there, to try to catch up problems there, so you have to go into later. There was a lot of cross pollination, and I would have saved a lot of time if I, from the start, would have uh, approached all problems at once and, and learned from them. Yeah, and it and I had to do that to get the speed. My third lesson is I was really wondering why had no one done that before? Because uh, it uh, we were actually um, dealing with some basic stuff like. Um, the brain freeze, which you all experience when you eat too much ice cream, um, is a basic instinct. And even um, the researchers didn't know if it's because artery dilatation or if it's a contraction. It was an open question in science. And one of the results of this experiment was it is artery dilatation. That's already a uh, result. Um, so uh, slower, but uh, gets more blood in your brain, and it and it is a an reflex uh, to preserve your life when you're in difficult uh, situation. And uh, what might be um, maybe um, a good solution is to use that reflex, which we could research with that experiments uh, to help um, heart attack um, patients. To, without uh, side effects and difficult medicaments, just uh, to put um, with cold water, uh, trigger that reflex and help them over the stroke. Um, but that is still research. Um, but maybe one time can a little per script can help some pro uh, stroke patients. So you know you have a lot of power when you program stuff. Um, be responsible. Thank you. Oh, he's muting it. Sorry. Okay. Hey, hey. Hi, I'm Ilya. Uh, I have to warn you that the uh, next slide contains a lot of terminology. It's domain specific. It would be the hardest part of this talk. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, uh, operations and SRE and system and DevOps are all the same. Done with the hard part. OK, so I'm talking about NGS. And if you are looking for modern language for operations people, um, the niche was not filled with anything before NGS, and that's why I created NGS. Um, I'm claiming that NGS is built ground up for operations, but what does that really mean? Uh, the common things that operations people do uh, will have either syntax or library functions. Um, so, and what are these things? Let's start with the small things. By the show of hands, how many of you have written more than 10 times uh, a function which is called log? Yeah, how about debug for, for conditional output? Mm, yeah, okay, no more. Um, okay, let's look at the bigger things. What you would be typically using NGS for? So since operations are increasingly about talking to APIs, and these are usually taking structured data and returning your structured data, 
the language should have uh, should support structured data first, unlike let's say Bash, um, and it also has to have the facilities to manipulate the data. So NGS a bunch uh, has a bunch of this. Um, working with files, some convenient uh, functions like serializing and then writing the file. Well, we still run processes, external processes. Uh, here you see very uh, unique feature which I didn't see in any other language. Uh, the double backtick syntax means run external program and parse the output. So the entity variable that you see here is actually a uh, data structure. Well, how about running a process in the background and having a reference to it, which is not just PID, but an object, so you can dot kill. Um, in BIMI, where I work, we also make um, tests. <laughs> we test our command line tools, and we do that with NGS. And being domain-specific language, it has uh, some uh, notable domain-specific assert functions. This function, for example, checks whether you have a DNS record um, another typical thing to check is that something that you is expect is actually on the page. Um, very simple, use assert has. You can also use NGS as part of your pipeline, uh, like you see in the example uh, in the last line. Uh, it has switches for it, and it has uh, special functions, uh, so they are making it easy. Uh, thank you. So, quick announcement. Uh, I work for Perceptics. Uh, we're a company that does a lot of employee surveys. We're all around the world and we're hiring. A lot of remote work. Uh, we also have an office that we just opened in Amsterdam. So, not much work in Amsterdam, I hear. Okay, maybe not. So, but, <laughs> uh, not many Perl developers there, right? Uh, but, so, uh, it's remote, it's a growing Perl shop, so uh, if you're interested in looking for work, we're looking for uh, seniors, juniors, pretty much everything right now. So, uh, thank you. Test, test? Okay, this works. Um, I was reading uh, about a bug and I I don't know why I was reading it because I didn't understand what I was reading and I noticed that they mentioned some uh, assistive technology we u was used in the bug and two days later I read another one that had the same thing and I wondered if this was a thing and could I collect them all. Um, and I found a couple and I thought I'd talk about them. Uh, exploits or, or vulnerabilities depending on whether or not they get used but usually you want to do something evil, you need access or privileges, you don't want to get caught. Uh, so you could use accessibility programs which tend to have access and privileges and hopefully you're doing it all for profit. So the first one I'm going to talk about is sticky keys, which I expect everyone in here to know what that is. Uh, but you know, if you can't hit keys with your finger yoga, you can use sticky keys to hit them sequentially and they'll all run at once. And it's apparently a well-known sysadmin trick that when the user walks up to you with their computer and they said, I locked myself out and I forgot my password, you can use sticky keys to get in and recover that. It's not just sticky keys, there's a few others that do it as well. Pretty much the debuggers for any of them also. Um, and people don't worry about it, and Windows isn't fixing it, because they think you need access, physical access to the machine. Uh, the one I was reading about, the bug I was reading about, uh, this is where I learned what domain fronting was, and I thought it was really cool. But So the network was already infected, but they wanted to really make sure they had good access. So the actual trick is, you take, it used to be called a set high contrast. I don't know when they changed what it did, but set high contrast now does sticky keys. And uh, you just put the command prompt in there and because it's got the same name and is in the same directory, it gets all the privileges. Um, and then they could proceed to do cool stuff like downloading things and making sure they had more access um, and there was profit somewhere involved. So that worked. So sticky keys can give you profit. Another one is alternative text, which a lot of people think of, oh, that's for uh, uh, people who are blind or have very low vision. So uh, anything that's got images usually has a, an alternative text field, even tables in PowerPoint, because tables in PowerPoint are not tables. Uh, so I was reading, like two days later, I was reading about this banking Trojan, and uh, what happens? Well, there's always a Word document with a malicious macro, of course, 
And in Word, you don't just have images, you can also have a shape, which is basically a collection of images. And suppose you wanted them to be treated as a single thing, it has its own alternative text field. And um, what this thing did was they didn't want anybody to see their horrible code, so they put it in the alt text field, it's just a plain old string, and then they could grab it later and get this banking trojan, and banking trojans are profit, so that worked. Next one is a, a browser-based uh, plugin, something called Browse Aloud. It's mostly used by governments because they want people to be able to click it and it'll start reading the text on the screen out loud. This is not for blind people. Um, and it had a funny name. Anyway, uh, people would call this the same way they call jQuery. So you'd go to the Browse Aloud site, you know, with your URL and you'd point to it and it would download the script. So somebody noticed that, hey, uh, I can maybe go in there where they're not watching anything, stick my own code in there. And what happened was is everybody visiting a website that had the Browse Aloud plugin was uh, doing some mining. You didn't have to actually click and use the thing. You simply had to be visiting the site and running JavaScript. Over 4,000 websites were affected and somebody somewhere profited. Cloak and Dagger, this one is for Android. Um, some people wrote a whole long uh, scary paper where basically they're complaining that houses have doors and that's bad because uh, people can break in through doors. So it's, most of their stuff was kind of BS. But Cloak & Dagger was interesting. On Android, uh, you down something, download something from the App Store and they would sometimes have the ability to always draw on top, whichever it is. So the user can see something. You always say the user always sees this thing. And the other thing they could do is they could say, I need access to the accessibility services part of Android. If you have access to Android accessibility services, then you can pretty much do anything because you might need to do that for assistive technology. So Google poo-pooed this because, yeah, that's how it works. But somebody else said, well, what about toasts? Those little notifications that pop up, they're always on top. So somebody said, well, how about we take a, to a toast and we change what it says so that the user thinks they're saying, yes, I want Pornhub, when in fact they're saying, yes, give me uh, the accessibility uh, um, services. So people were basically giving things all the permissions, thinking they were allowing, say, for example, porn. Um, and somebody profited, apparently, from it. So it wasn't even just a, a, a vulnerability. It was an actual exploit that somebody used. And the last one is copying the clipboard. Um, normally, the operating system is smart. It says, hey, if this thing is not supposed to be visible, maybe we shouldn't, uh, maybe we shouldn't copy it. So um, on some Linuxes, if you're running GNOME, you've got the GNOME Toolkit. And the GNOME Toolkit's got a copy clipboard thing. And it checks, hey, is this supposed to be visible? Oh, if it's not, it will fail. It won't copy. That's good. That's how it should work. But if you're using assistive technology, like the Orca screen reader, then you've got the accessibility toolkit is running alongside the GNOME Toolkit. And it's got its own special version of copying text. It figures out what it wants, then it goes back to GTK, but it doesn't look for the copy clipboard one. It looks for, I need you to get me some characters. And GNOME Toolkit's like, oh, I'll get you some characters. It's fortunately fixed, and no, there was no profit because this is Linux. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. got anything to speak about. Think somebody just works on yours?
So uh, I don't know if you are using Part Six. So maybe uh, if you are using Part Six and you are testing whatever you are you are using, like your module or whatever, maybe your test is something like that. It takes nine minutes. Why? Because it's downloading Rakudo. It's compiling Rakudo, then installing whatever it needs, and then, then it's running your your test. So your test tests are like you know two minutes, but it's doing a lot of stuff. So start doing that. You should, I mean, this is, this is what it's doing, you know, Rakudo and whatever, everything else. Yeah, we can use Docker. We can use Docker containers. And then we can use something like this, this .travis.yml. Basically, we, we are going to do this. We are going to use this container, and that's it. Then it will take two minutes instead of nine minutes. Why? Because it's only taking time to download your, your container, installing whatever module you, you need. And that's it. Maybe, I mean, that's fast. But maybe you have open SSL. What does it mean? It means that you, you are going to need to install something else before you are installing your, your Per6 modules. But we also have this Docker container. So we can use that directly. And that's it. So please, you can get test results while you wait because it takes two minutes or, or three minutes, or whatever. And also, Use always this per six Docker containers. That's it. Thank you. Ta-da! Let's talk about space, because space is cool. Uh, so if you were watching any kind of news last year, uh, last, last month, you would have realized that Apollo 11 celebrated its 50th anniversary last month, 50 years since we met and that first landed on the moon. Uh, now, I am just, only just, old enough to remember the original mission. And back in 1969, I was a huge fan of anything connected to space. Uh, here is pictorial evidence of a photo taken about the same time. Uh, to be fair, in 2019, I'm still a big fan of everything connected to space. I don't have a similar photo to tell you of that. So, um, Sunday, 14th of July, uh, this year, uh, so about three weeks ago, I'm sitting at my desktop in my flat and I'm working on my slides for talks for this conference. But actually I'm thinking, really there should be a Twitter bot that does something to celebrate Apollo 11. And I'm thinking, what it could do is it could actually tweet the mission timeline in, well, I was going to say in real time, but in real time plus 50 years. Um, but Actually, what I'm thinking is, writing that's going to be a lot more interesting than writing these talks that I'm writing. <laughs> so, time passes. Uh, yeah, about 90 minutes passes, and um, and we have a, a Twitter bot. Uh, obviously, originally at that point, it didn't have all the tweets attached to it, but um, it took me about 90 minutes to 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 get to from thinking this would be cool to actually this is live on Twitter and working. So I thought. Um, it's, it's there, it's, it's at Apollo 11 at 50. Um, and so I thought I'd share, I've probably got maybe three and a half minutes left to show you how to write a Twitter bot. Um, so now what, you need three, three, three things. You need some data to tweet, you need some code to do the tweeting, um, and you need some images to make your Twitter account look pretty. Uh, the, so look at, look at the data first. Um, so I talked about um, wanting to tweet the Apollo 11 timeline. So when I wanted to find some data, obviously I googled Apollo 11 mission timeline, uh, and I found this page on the NASA website, a, a table uh, which has got um, uh, some text, and then the GMT time and date of when this took place. Um, you'll notice that I said I was doing this on um, July the 14th, um, and the first date in that column is July the 14th. So I was under a little bit of pressure, which is why. <laughs> uh, but 
But this is just a simple HTML table, so a bit of screen scraping, a bit of data munging, I know how to do that. Um, and then stick it in a database. Uh, code, well, code, the code actually turns out to be really easy. There's a thing called net Twitter on um, CPAN, and it just works. There's nothing that you need to do. Um, you need to register for a, devel a, a developer account at Twitter, but that seems to all be automated because it, I got an approval through within about two minutes of submitting the form. Uh, the code is there on GitHub if anybody wants to see, but it's not really not very clever because I wrote it in less than 90 minutes. Uh, images. Now, images was interesting because um, I didn't know how I, what, where I'd find images, but it turns out that nobody ever accused NASA of not taking enough photos. <laughs> They have thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands, and as a bonus, they're all freely licensed for you to use however you want. Um, so then the next thing I needed to think about was deployment, and of course all the sexy things these days, GitHub, a bit of Travis C CI perhaps, Docker images, deploying on AWS, ECS. Well, I only had 90 minutes, so... Um, it was a real, it was a git checkout onto a real com, com computer that had a cron job running on it. Um, first couple of tweets didn't work. Uh, I'm not a sys admin, okay. Uh, uh, but eventually we got some tweets working. Uh, lift off, lunar landing, and then, oh shit. Unicode fail on the most important tweet in the series, the one that said, one small step for a man. It was an easy fix though, so I fixed it, uh, and it'll work when we do it again in 2029. <laughs> uh, it hasn't finished tweeting yet. There are three more tweets to go, um, but you'll have to follow it to find out when they appear. So once again, that's at Apollo 11 at 50, um, and if you want something that carries on tweeting after that, please follow me, because I'm needy. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, as some of you have noticed, I've got a new tattoo recently. Uh, and instead of explaining it 50 times to each person, I'm explaining it to everybody. Uh, so I was thinking about getting a new tattoo and I was planning to do something about math, about interesting numbers, something like square root of 2 or pi p, phi, e, square root of minus 1, uh, powers of 2, prime numbers, Fibonacci sequence, something like that. Uh, and I wanted to do something with an, on a number line, or Zahlenstrahl in German. Uh, so I drew something on a piece of paper which looked a little bit like that, like a line with some marks for different numbers. And then I realized that, okay, I want to have, I didn't like that a lot and it was boring uh, drawing it on paper, so I wanted to automate it. Um, so I thought, okay, let's write some SVG. SVG, of course, scalar vector graphics is XML, so that's the source code of this tattoo. Um, SVG is just some XML thing where I say, okay, you want to draw a line from uh, with that color in black from here to there, or you can draw a cycle, circle uh, in green at that position with that radius. So it's very easy XML format. Uh, you can do it manually with something, for example, called Inkscape, which is a program which takes even longer than drawing it on, on a paper with a pen. So I, I ditched it again. And of course, Perl has SVG. Uh, module. This is Perl 5. There's also Perl 6 SVG thing, what I did in Perl 5. So you say, okay, get, generate my new SVG thingy, define some styles. For example, you want this thing should be uh, green. And then just a simple thing of taking the Fibonacci sequence, which is hard-coded in here, and then loop through it, get this, the current number and the next number, convert the numbers to some to the x coordinates that you need on the on the uh, in the SVG thingy and then draw a cycle circle oh, sorry I'm sort of fixated on cycles I don't know why <laughs> uh, so draw a circle uh, uh, using some calculated diameter radius in the center it's and then you have a cy circle <laughs> um, so now I had some tools to play with different ideas so this was the first thing which is just a, a line 
uh, this, the straight lines are powers of two, the circles are the Fibonacci sequence, and the X are the primes. And sometimes they combine to things. This so is another thing which you can hardly see, some colors. Uh, interesting thing, it's, it's on a log two scale. Uh, another thing with some colors. Uh, yeah. And then I thought, oh, maybe I can just connect those points to get some, to draw some cycles. But I think that looked too much like a mandel pole thingy. Uh, so I just cut it in half and then basically connected those things. I can, I can see it a little bit, I guess. <laughs> Um, but then I realized, okay, no, but now I have like a lot of different permutations to go in different directions and different colors. But anyways, I had the script and I generated a lot of stuff and I printed it out and played around with it for a few months. And then finally decided on this design where the blue line is the powers of two, the green line is the Fibonacci sequence and red is prime. Uh, yeah, so that's what you have on here. So now the next step was to, you know, go to this strange print shop where they have this uh, happy needles, it's called, where they have this one dot matrix printer with like one needle. <laughs> <laughs> and they have this very nice print driver and you, <laughs> you hand this guy the, the piece of paper and then he, you know, takes a needle and takes that thing and puts it under your skin. And well. So that's the fresh tattoo with a shaved arm. I also don't shave my arm that often. So that's how I did math, SVG and Perl to generate my new tattoo and that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Job, and uh, I'm uh, woo, just another pro hacker. I'm glad you asked. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents bought this machine. It was an Acorn BBC, 32 kilobytes, and I wrote my first code on it when I was about eight. And I kept doing that, and eventually I got to make a living out of writing code. And I got my first real programming job in 2001. And I worked for a company that made, oh, what did they make? What did they make? This company they made, suspension systems. Get it? Okay. So they made suspension systems, and uh, I, <laughs> I wrote code there. And in 2005, I had pretty much become the IT guy there. And they wanted a whole new building and a new network. And since I was the IT guy, surely I could also do all the networking stuff. So sure, why not? And this was a different time. This was a different scary time. And there weren't a dynamic website where customers could see what suspension we offered for which motorcycle types. And I heard of this one language, and I had this book. So I went to this community, and uh, that's where I wanted to learn the language. And this community website that still exists, promonks.org, they had a, a chat system. Very interesting. Basically, a bunch of frames that reloaded uh, in time. So I started to hang out there on a daily basis. And uh, I was also learning uh, FreeBSD, next learning pro, because I wanted to set up a Unix-based server to run the DNS and the DHCP and the internet and the postfix. So I figured, why not ask there? And there was this guy called Martin V. And uh, I'd ask him, like, hey, how do I do this? And how do I set up this? And he wouldn't tell me how to do it. He'd say, oh, run this man page. Or uh, you want to look at this command. He wouldn't tell me the solution. He'd just tell me kind of where to look. And I am really grateful to this guy for teaching me so much. But at some point, he got a girlfriend, and he left, and we never saw him again. Uh, Corian, always there, always answering my questions. Great guy. I think he's here somewhere. Corian, where are you? He's here, right? Someone? Hey! And I, I think he's still there nowadays. Um, intrepid. I had a lot of discussions with this guy about Buddhism and metaphysics. Digital Kitty would tell us all these stories about her crazy, crazy life in Phoenix, Arizona. And she disappeared years ago, and I hope that she's still out there somewhere and will come back someday. Uh, Hervius, he uh, was uh, the first Quaker I met. And he had his loom, and he went to all these Renaissance fairs, and he made this hat, and very cool. Landscape, lots of discussions uh, with her on politics and religion, and recently my wife found her on Twitter, so yeah, well now we, we met again after years of not talking. Uh, Marto, uh, my wife and I met him in Glasgow, went out for drinks, whiskey, scotch, fun, fun, fun. Um, 
I got my first full-time programming job through ProMonks. Jay Brugger said, hey, we're looking for somebody. What about you? And I said, sure. And that's where also Basha worked. And he was the network admin. He really improved my knowledge on, on uh, system administration in Unix. And I got my second full-time programming job through this guy, Clinton, also via ProMonks. Hit me up and said, hey, uh, I heard you're decent. I know where he got that idea. But he offered me a job. And... Uh, he, he taught me so much, really taught me how to grow as a programmer, really mentored me closely. And whenever I mentor a newer programmer nowadays, I try to do what he did. These slides look like obituaries. Not true. These people are all alive. He also took me to my first YAPSI. This was amazing. My first YAPSI in 2008, I had never been to a conference before. So imagine one of the first talk I hear is Damien Conway talking about Pearl. So. <laughs> That really just set these really high expectations I had for Yapsies. And, and I was just standing near a book table, minding my own business. And suddenly this really tall woman walks up to me and says, have you gotten around to it? I'm like, I don't know what you mean. Have you gotten around to it? I don't know. And then she had to be around to it, 2008 to it, people. Um, and, and, and there's so much stuff here at Yapsies. You know, every time we sit and chat, an effort that, oh, come on, none of you remember that? That was Pierce singing. Um, so, yeah, Wolfie uh, handed me uh, my first to it. Uh, I had my first time speaking at the Yapsi 2010 Lightning Talks. Way more nervous than I am right now. Right now, like, yeah, whatever. Um, so that really helped. Uh, but also, you know, Pearl is not just nice. You also get this stigma, like, oh, you do Pearl? Uh, I once had an interview. I had an interview for a Python job, and I had to do a coding challenge. I had to do a coding challenge on the screen. So they would look at the projector while I was writing code. I had to do a bunch of data munching. Okay, go, start, Python. That's like data munching. I started writing some regexes. Oh, yeah, you're that Pearl guy. I saw it in your resume. Yeah, you can't use regular expressions. Okay, so yeah, time I had behind my back while you're at it. So, um, or it was this meetup, and this guy asked, so what do you do for work? Oh, I write Perl. Really? Oh, I could never do Perl. Oh, that would just be horrible. Okay, so what do you do? Oh, I write PHP. Okay, fine. <laughs> so eventually I went freelance, and uh, well, where do you go for help? You go to the Perl community. So Markov, there you are, Markov, thank you. I was so nervous being a freelancer, and he just said, stop worrying about it, just, I'll teach you how to cheat the system. And now I'm just a really great freelancer. And uh, I got my first freelance job through Herman, who is here somewhere. Where are you, Herman? Thank you. Uh, got me a job uh, doing Pearl for some company. Um, other freelancing job I got through Ovid, uh, who's out here somewhere, and he got me a job with his wife's company. And I got to work on this really cool project called Tau Station, and I got to drink beer with Sispeed and go to Dan Cons in Vienna, and I met uh, Jason Chrome, and he taught me how to be a decent team lead. And he even drove for four hours from Chicago to Michigan when I was there to visit the uh, in-laws. Uh, I worked for Andy Beverly, Control O, again, pro work, but I also got to do my first usability study. I got to do accessibility there. Uh, bless you. Um, and nowadays, I'm doing Elixir, and I have to learn this language. So where do you go when you learn a language? You go to IRC. It's kind of like Slack without jiffies. Um, so. <laughs> I'm at the IRC channel, I'm like, hey, I want to do this and this, and, and some people are helping me, and one guy says, oh, I know somebody with your nickname, but that's probably not you. And, I, and this, this person was called Disfun, and I said, well, that depends. Are you tech practical on Twitter? And he says, yeah, that's me. Oh, hi, James. Hi, Job. <laughs> so it's sometimes, I wonder if I can ever escape this community, because it's just been with me for so, so many years. Uh, Sawyer, uh, you think you're out there? Yeah. Uh, he told me how to say Lachayim, and I still need practice, but that means cheers, I've heard. Um, Gareth Kerwin put me in a jiu-jitsu chokehold by my own request, didn't tell me that I should have tapped out, so my eyes rolled back, always went out of it. So this has been so much fun. So this is mostly just a thank you to you, amazing pro community, for being so formative in my life and so amazing through all these years. Thank you so much. <laughs> So that's the end of the first day of Lightning Talks. We're going to do this two more times. There is still lots of space available. I would like to get tomorrow all filled up and sorted out by lunch. So please submit through the website and come by and see me. Mostly when you uh, submit, do it right after you come by and see me and tell me that you're doing it so that I can put the two things together because my mind's not where it was anymore. And remember, memory is the second thing to go. Uh, so 
that should be about it, and we have a few announcements about tonight.